face it, the digital revolution is over. From the wide open pastures to the confines of urban life, progress has been the name of the game for centuries. But if technological advancement has taken center stage in humanity's history, there's also a group of people who envisioned a different kind of life. But first, some context. Oliver Twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last, they got so voracious and wild with hunger that one boy, who was tall for his age and hadn't been used to that sort of thing or his father had kept a small cook shop, hinted darkly at his companions that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next to him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye. They implicitly believed him. The Industrial Revolution is marked as one of the biggest turning points in human history, only behind humanity's adoption of agriculture in terms of technological advancement and material production. Everything you have right now, from the clothes on your back to the lights in your house, can be seen as a product of the Industrial Revolution. It was also the first time that sustained economic growth on a macro scale started to happen, and productivity was through the roof compared to the local small-scale cottage industry of the past. But on the ground, it was a different story. Working conditions were horrendous, and people worked an average 12 to 16 hour shifts six days a week. Wages were awful, with working class people barely scraping by, with many suffering from malnutrition and starvation. Industrial towns were disease-ridden, had poor sanitation, and pollution was a major problem in these areas. It wasn't until the second industrial revolution that things started to get a little better, when prices of goods dropped dramatically because of increased production, and there were massive improvements in public health and sanitation measures. It was a period of immense economic growth as well, but also a time of increased unemployment due to machines taking over many factory jobs that initially arose during the first industrial revolution. And now we land on the timeline that most of us are familiar with. The third industrial revolution, also known as the digital revolution, occurred in the late 20th century and is marked by the shift from analog technology to digital technology. On paper, we all just basically updated our tech, but in reality, it fundamentally changed our world. How we communicate, how we buy and sell things, how information is exchanged, how we find partners, how we make a living, everything changed with this advancement in digital computing. And these major shifts brought about what we now call the information age. But before we move further into the future, I want to introduce a set of characters within this timeline. Romanticism is hard to pin down, but it was initially a reaction to the rigid values of the Age of Enlightenment and its ideas that order and rationality should be at the center of society. The Romanticists prioritized imagination over structure, emotion over logic, and nature over industry. It's not so much that they thought being orderly and logical was just absolutely bad. It was more a critique on living only for progress and viewing the world solely through a scientific lens. The movement was also closely tied to the first industrial revolution and we all know how horrible day-to-day -day life was for most people at that time despite all the technological and economic progress that was made. Exploitation was rampant, and workers often had to endure extremely dangerous living and working conditions without fair compensation. Child labor was extremely common, as many families couldn't afford to eat or pay for shelter without the smallest members of the family contributing as well. So to the Romanticists, the Industrial Revolution might have brought in an era of progress, but at what cost? 
The Romantic's view of the world is a reflection of their view of humanity. The world is rich, full of qualities, color, sound, flavor, feeling. Thick, you might say, and not the thin, gray, empty thing as pictured by modern science. They tended to ignore metaphysical speculation as an intellectual game. And for Schopenhauer, passion became the basic form of all reality, a universe pressing to be realized. All experience is subjective as well as objective. This is a sort of uncertainty principle that applies to all sciences and philosophy and certainly psychology. Objectivity is simply a meaningless goal, so subjectivity is not something to eliminate, but to understand. Looking at the state of everyday life during the Industrial Revolution, I can definitely see how many people felt like things really didn't get that much better than living on a farm like they used to, if not worse. So Romanticism was an intellectual movement that partially developed as a response to the Industrial Revolution and all of its ugly sides. But besides the philosophical values surrounding this school of thought, it was first and foremost an artistic movement. Poetry, paintings, literature, music, sculptures. You would think that these romanticists just wanted to frolic out on the hills or something, but they were definitely a productive bunch in their passions. It's not to say that these artists, musicians, writers, and thinkers just abandon their privileged, sometimes even aristocratic lives to go be a shepherd or something. In fact, far, far from it. But the thought was there. Some of our most celebrated works of art were made by the Romanticists, many still continuing their journey of inspiration, not just in museums, but online and on social media. In fact, internet aesthetics and lifestyle movements like cottagecore, van life, slow living, all take inspiration from the Romanticists, sometimes just visually, but oftentimes in ethos as well. But back to our timeline. So we talked about the first three industrial revolutions, the last being the digital revolution and our entry into the information age. We are here now, also known as the mid-digital era. We're still living in the information age, but we're yet to be completely immersed into a fully digital society. A good chunk of the population was born before the digital revolution and remember a time when digital technology did not exist at all. The economy is dominated by knowledge workers using computers for research, finance, tech, etc, etc. So, what comes next? The Imagination Age is a period of time that's dominated by the imagination economy, also known as creative work. In this time period, information processing will no longer be the top line of work, and creativity and intuition will become skills that are highest in terms of economic value. It's a hypothetical time period that takes place beyond the information age and within the post-digital era. But as much as the imagination age sounds like a relatively hopeful future, and the creative economy has grown over the past few decades, work as we know it right now has become unhinged in many ways, both creative or not. The social safety nets and welfare structures that were put into place to improve the horrible working conditions of the industrial age have started to unravel, and everybody is becoming a temporary contract worker. There are fewer stable job opportunities available, and competition is intense in almost every sector. As of now, it's leaning more gig economy than imagination economy. I watched a TikTok video the other day about AI art that I cannot for the life of me find again, but I read a comment under it saying how we're all here writing emails and filling out spreadsheets and doing taxes, while AI is making pretty pictures and writing music. But anyway, as we saw in the first industrial revolution, major societal shifts combined with pretty bad living standards will always give rise to people who envision a different kind of life.
So as we saw with the original romanticists, idealizing rural life is really nothing new. And even before romanticism got its name, this yearning to go back to nature or to just live a quiet country lifestyle has been around even before urban spaces became a thing. But this longing to reconnect with the natural world has come back into fashion once again within the past few years, but this time in a digital format. There may be many reasons to why the cottagecore aesthetic, slow living lifestyles, or the I don't dream of labor movement have become extremely popular in this decade. But we can view this as a sign of people, especially young people, becoming rather exhausted by the troubles of modern life. Just as how romanticism in its original form was a reaction to the brutal side of the industrial revolution, this new updated version of rural escapism can be seen as a reaction to the cold, calculated, hyper-competitive hustle culture mentality that took over the digital revolution. And once again, like the original movement, the new romanticists are far from actual farmers and shepherds and gardeners. In fact, most young people who engage in this aesthetic are doing so online and on social media only. It's a curated, idealized vision board of country life, not a practical, realistic one. But it doesn't have to be. Because let's face it, most people cannot afford a beautiful cottage in the countryside with a picturesque garden. And even if they could, rural living is not as pretty or as easy as it's visualized to be in these compilations. But what we can get from it is not so much a realistic guide on country living, but reflection and inspiration, regardless of whether it's performative or not. This particular aesthetic has been able to persist throughout the years, at a time when aesthetics are cycled in and out of trend in the matter of weeks. And this is because it often sparks a deep desire in people to take a step back and reflect on the beauty of ordinary things that may have become lost despite all the progress we've gained. Unlike the monumentality of the original romanticists, these new romanticists elevate the simple things, where something as mundane as baking bread or foraging from mushrooms can transform into a poetic reminder that there is a kind of magic in these ordinary activities that may have been drowned by the hustle and bustle of modern life. Time spent on cooking, reading, or having a picnic to more grander elements like the presence of nature and the disappearance of it from our day to day are all reminded through this aesthetic. Romanticism as a whole often references the past, but what these new romanticists can portray is an ideal vision of what life in the future in the imagination age could be. Where automation, digitization, and artificial intelligence truly sets us free by giving us more time to create, to rest, and to just enjoy life in whatever way we want to, whether that's in a cozy cottage in the countryside or deep in a neon city. If technology is used in the right way to provide meaningful improvement in people's lives rather than just doing whatever is the most profitable in the short term, this is where we can be. We've already spent a good number of decades glorifying the grind, but the grind can only go so far until it starts grinding you down. We don't know what the next few decades will be defined as in the history books, but we know there is another shift coming soon. So will the imagination age be a time of creative prosperity or will it just be another repetition of all the industrial ages we had so far where the masses continue to struggle? I am the last person on this earth to go running off into the woods, but I still can't help but imagine a future where our basic needs are taken care of so I can spend more time creatively frolicking on my couch. Thank you for watching and please like and subscribe for more.